Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. I'm Bob, and this is Mike, who's joining me today. He's part of the Bob and Brad crew. Yep. So he's actually got his, they got their own channel too. So he's going to help me out here because we both have had experience with this title today, gassy, bloated, constipated, how to treat. And we both individually went on the FODMAP diet, F-O-D-M-A-P. Um, let's just say right off the, uh, at the start here, Mike, we're not dietitians, nutritionists. No. I'm a PT assistant who's worked with Bob, yeah, so that's and, how we know each other. And I'm a physical therapist, so yeah. we're not experts on this, but we're here to tell our personal experiences and our approach about using the FODMAP diet. And uh, I, I think it could be very helpful to you in the end. Yeah. So, so Mike, when you want to talk first about, I want you to tell me your what your symptoms were when you and why you kind of even looked at the FODMAP diet. Uh, so for me personally, it was a lot of, uncomfortable amount of bloating and gas and it would get worse throughout the day so I've done different eating styles over the years um, you know when I was young I didn't really know what caused it uh, it wasn't terrible I just thought I was a so you had person. a long time yeah and then when I got older I was eating more like cleaner foods but I was still getting a lot of gas and the joke is you know when you're eating more protein it's protein farts when you're a kid um, but honestly, it's not that at all. When you start to look no, into it's it, not. it's carbohydrates fermenting in your stomach. So for me, it was never like, like IBS symptoms or anything terrible like that, or like, I don't have celiac disease or anything. Um, uh, but for me, it was just, it gets uncomfortable. <laughs> and if you live with someone, they really don't want to be around you, you know, if you're right. having all this gas basically. Yeah. And, uh, I think th this is a good time to say here, Mike, too, this isn't about eating healthy versus non-healthy. Yeah. There, there's a lot of healthy, almost all of the FODMAPs are healthy foods. Yeah. There's a, so. there's a wide range of foods, which are, you know, good to eat or not good to eat. And then everyone's going to be different, which foods they can and can't eat. So, so now my symptoms were, came on like over a period of like two or three months. And just recently, yeah. So it, it was way different uh, situation than Mike's, but it it would like every day around two o'clock. It seems like it would start picking up. <laughs> you at a time. And, and well, I did, it, and I I don't know if my mind started creating that time, but um, it would go until almost till bedtime. It was just it was I thought it was miserable, Mike. I yeah. Mean, it was the same symptoms you had, but I I mean I was like, who can live like this? I mean, I couldn't I couldn't lie on my stomach like mm -hmm. when I would read. I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't really concentrate really very well either. Yeah. It's very distracting. It is. Uh, and it's like, you <laughs> almost have to plan not to be around people as right. the day goes on. If you're having gastrointestinal issues like that. Um, it definitely can increase anxiety and stress. Like I, I would start yeah. getting stressed out around two o'clock and mm -hmm. <laughs> because I knew it was coming on. So. Yeah. And this can happen from like, People that are eating, you know, a standard American diet can have it. People eating, you know, any style diet you want, low carb, high carb, it doesn't matter. Um, some of these FODMAP foods are in every genre. It's not just like, you know, only this does it, only that does it. Like there's a list of foods, but it's not like, you know, a specific it, diet is, you can do numerous diets and do FODMAP, I should yeah, say. Yeah, so you could be a vegetarian and do FODMAP. A little yeah. more difficult, but um, yeah. uh, it, you, you certainly can do it. It, uh, I, let's talk about what FODMAP is. Um, it, first off, it, it, it's basically your body is not processing carbs very well. Yep. They're fermenting in your stomach, essentially. Um, do you want me to read? Yeah, what it why don't is? you read that? So um, this is from Monash University. They are the basically the University of Melbourne, Australia that coined the term FODMAP. So uh, it's M-O-N-A-S-H. Yeah. University. You can go to their site. They also have an app. Uh, according to their site, FODMAPs are a group of sugars that are not completely digested or absorbed in our intestines. So when FODMAPs reach the small intestine, which is right after the stomach, it goes into the small intestine, uh, they move slowly, attracting water. When they bypass into the large intestine, which is also known as your colon, if you're curious, um, FODMAPs are fermented by gut bacteria producing gas as a result. So the extra gas and the water cause the intestinal wall to stretch and expand. So this is known as bloating uh, for us because people with IBS have a highly sensitive gut. Um, stretching the intestinal wall causes exaggerated sensations of pain and discomfort. So 
this is commonly used for people with IBS. Like what you say is irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah, um, which I like. We don't. We're not diagnosed with IBS. I, no, it's hard to be diagnosed with it. Actually, sometimes it's a rule of uh, the omission. You know that yeah. it, it wasn't other things. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, inflammatory bowel disease, same thing. You know. Yeah, there's a lot of these stomach issues. FODMAP can help. Like I know people with Crohn's have yeah. also looked at it. Um, SIBO, SIBO, SIBO. Yeah, SIBO um, is another one. Um, uh, Gastrointensive intensity, uh, intestinal sensitivity. Yeah. Um, just like what you kind of alluded to. Mm -hmm. So it's it's. Uh, well, right now we should tell you though they, they, on the studies it showed that it ha helped like 85 percent of the ones with IBS. So I mean, there's yeah. a good chance this is going to help you. I, I just want to. It definitely helped us too. Mm -hmm. And my daughter had stomach issues for years, and I I I actually was thankful that I got this because <laughs> I passed it on to her, and she's finally. She says it's the breast is, is felt in years. Like yeah. she, it's finally getting over it. So it is. Um, they do say like fifteen percent of the world's population has IBS, uh, according so to it's one out of seven. And, and, yep. um, and then yeah, like they said, you know, typically three out of four people have success. So you know, there is like a small percentage of people that don't find a lot right. of benefit, but it helps most people. So obviously there's different numbers out there because I had said 85%. And I, I also saw three out of four too. Oh well, yeah, I mean, so, 75, 80%. Right. Well, I think similar. part of it is that they all people that have IBS don't even know it sometimes. And, yeah, I mean, I didn't know what it was called. <laughs> like, right. I just thought I was a it's, it's, person. I mean, you know, it's miserable. It, it really is. Yeah, I, I, I can't say that enough. I just I, I just thought it really affects your life. It it. it you know, it affects whether you go out, mm -hmm. you know, it affects, you know, your anxiety levels. I mean, it's just, so, you know, why don't we talk about what FODMAP stands for? F O D M A P. Sure. I can start with the F it, sure. it's the fermentation. So you're, you're fermenting the carbs and they give off carbon dioxide, methane and hydrogen, which is gas, gas, gas. Yeah. So yeah. Again, for me, I felt like I, I, I felt like I always had to go like a, a bowel movement. Oh, really? You know? Yeah. Mine, I didn't and, feel and, like and that. I, I never would, you know, though I'd, I'd go on the toilet and it would just be gas. Yeah. So, all right. How about the O? Like, so the O stands for oligosaccharides. Uh, oligosaccharides are known as fructans or galactans. So these are typically found in wheat, rye, legumes, uh, various fruits and vegetables, such as garlic and onions. So all these saccharides there are going to be numerous of them oglio means there's a few uh the next one right. is disaccharides di means two so disaccharides is a d uh that is lactose so yeah that's mainly lactose i think they caught, talked about um was this uh sucrose or is that that's a different one that's a different one okay um but there was one other thing that really wasn't a problem though yeah Lactose, you know, that's in your milk, your yogurt, your soft cheeses. Most people know someone that's lactose intolerant. Um, this is technically part of FODMAP. Uh, next would be monosaccharides. So this is fructose um, found in various fruits, including figs, mangoes, um, sweeteners such as honey, agave, nectar, where fructose is your main carb source. Well, the other one is high fructose corn syrup, yep, which is, I, to be honest, you shouldn't be eating it anyway. I mean, yeah. that, that's one you should one ingredient should avoid all the time <laughs> yeah. Yeah, from a health standpoint. But but yeah, that's the one you'll have to look for in the, in the ingredients. So now we're on letter A, that just stands for and. Right, there we go. <laughs> uh, P is polyols. So this is known as sorbitol or mannitol. Um, those you often see ingredients in like sugar-free gum or yes. mints like that. Um, they're also found in stone fruits or they're also known as droops, D R. UPE, um, but they include stuff like avocados, peaches. Uh, a stone fruit is typically a fruit that has a large pit, uh, essentially, if you want to look into that. So but. yeah, polyols are, are sugar alcohols, but it, it's basically any ingredient with the itol, uh, you know, in yep. uh, mannitol, xylitol, you know, As so, zorbitol, right. Yeah. So, you know, we should say right now, this is like, well, all these foods, how am I going to know what to do? Yeah. Now you put down in the comments, Yep, in the, in the description below. Description below, yeah, a list. I mean, you can, you can Google it too. You're gonna. Find yep, a list. you just look up low FODMAP is what you want to eat if you have these problems, and high FODMAP are the foods you typically want to avoid. So what they recommend is sticking to the low FODMAP foods for four to six weeks, roughly, and then 
try to add certain high FODMAP foods back in that you like and right. see how your body reacts. Cause some of those high FODMAP foods aren't going to affect everyone the same. So it's like, it's an elimination at first. And then you put back in what doesn't cause these symptoms. Yeah. It's, it, and you have to watch portion control too. Yeah, It's very uh, difficult. And I, I want to say right here, Mike, that a lot of times you're going to find uh, discrepancies in, in people saying how yep. much they should use and should not use. And I would, uh, I always relied on Monash, M O N A S H, as the reliable authority. Yeah. They're the ones that have done the testing on it. They actually have an app, uh, you know, just look up Monash and the app. Yeah. And I got the app. It was definitely worth it. My daughter got it. You, It's on your phone then. No matter where you're at, you can just push on it as fruits, vegetables, you know, everything in there. You can find it really. It's got recipes in there. Yeah. So, and it tells you exactly how much you can have. Like almonds is a good example. There are galactins mm -hmm. and you can have 10 almonds. Yeah. Some of them are limited. So yeah. like for me, like if you listen to our other one, I primarily eat, I eat keto now. So a lot of these there's not a, as many options on keto. So that just naturally helped a lot of these FODMAP issues. But there are some foods I eat that are on are high FODMAP. Like I eat uh, almonds and cashews and stuff. I eat nuts. They don't really bother me. Um, avocado is technically a high FODMAP. And that is a pretty big staple in my diet. So all I do is I eat like half of one at a time. I may get a little bloating, but it's not like I'm that's, uncomfortable. That's it's like a I'm natural amount. And yeah. even if, you know, if I produce gas from it, like it doesn't have like an odor, like it's not like <laughs> the methane. Yeah. The methane odor the one, is what happens with yeah, FODMAP. When you, when you really have a smell, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's likely the methane uh, byproduct that, mm -hmm. that's not getting absorbed. And so you know, one thing you should know about this too is that relief is fairly rapid. I yeah. mean, if you start this, you're going to be motivated to continue on it because um, I, I started getting some relief within a day or two, but and then I, I I wasn't being really strict, and it was same with my daughter. She wasn't being really strict, mm -hmm. and so it was like just kind of hanging in there yet, and and then I got really strict, and then it went away. I mean, it, it just it, you know I don't know you're going to be a hundred percent better in seven days, but you're going to be so much better that you're going to yeah I, I believe on their site on monash site it said typically within two weeks people will notice a sure. lot of change um and when you do reintroduce foods they say just do one don't like right. try to add three things because right. you're not going to know you're which not going to causes which one. the problem and you also this is one thing i found out and this kind of messed with my daughter is that you, if it, the food is affecting you it's not going to affect you like right after the meal it's, it's yeah. going to take like four to six hours. So it's something that you ate four to six hours a day or even a day before. Yeah. So you, you really, if it's, if it's affecting you right after the meal, that's not FODMAP. That's something else. You might have some type of sensitivity or something that issue going on, but it's definitely mm -hmm. not FODMAP. So, so again, you, you can also, you know, go online, make a copy of the foods or you can get the uh, app and yeah and, and they're broken down into every category so it'll be you know fruits vegetables grains um oils meats uh whatever black milk and stuff and they'll have like you know alternatives to uh say you have something you really like it'll give you alternative options as well yeah now it like we said it's a two-phase thing you, the elimination phase i've also i had a book uh mike that actually talked about just doing the elimination phase for like seven days even. So, yeah. I mean, you could, you don't necessarily have to go um, the six to eight weeks, but yeah. uh, you, you know, you can experiment. I think I went like three to four. And those so. were like, those recommendations are based off people that have pretty bad IBS. Yes. Right. So like, I don't like, cause some people with IBS, like I had a friend that had it bad and he would like have to go like all of a sudden. Right, was, right. We'd be driving, he'd have to pull over. Right. And we, he would have to run. I mean, he was taking Imodium, you know, at times to control sure. it basically. But he's since, you know, cleaned up his diet a lot. And he doesn't have these issues either anymore. But Sure. Uh, the other thing is, you know, some of these, uh, in addition to the foods, you have to look for ingredients too. You know, like when you're, uh, getting uh, certain foods, you have to look for onion powder, yeah, garlic powder. You're going to have more troubles with processed foods, yeah. If we're being honest, like a lot of those, you don't always know what it is because there's, you know, the ingredient list is this huge, yes. you can't pronounce half of it. Um, yeah, you're 
probably better off just staying away from it unless you know it doesn't bother yeah, you. Yeah, again, the eye tolls are going to, you know, would be one to skip away from. But it, and also, if you look at the ingredients, the ones that are the highest concentration are the first ingredients. Yeah. So, like, if you have it, if it's listed way down the list, you might be able to get a bit away with it. You know, yeah. or if it's, you know, if there's uh, onion powder and it's the last ingredient of 30, you know, there's yeah. maybe very little in there. So. Yeah, I want to point out this too, Mike. I, I had trouble getting enough fiber when I first started on this diet because suddenly I switched to eggs and meat and you know what I mean? Yeah. And and so I, I it was a little bit difficult for me. So I actually got constipated at first, which um, is not fun either. Yeah. So I, I mean, I guess I didn't have that issue as much. I mean, when I went to keto, I guess I get less fiber in general. But that's more like my body was getting used to the increase of fat intake. So that kind of led to like loose stool for me. But that corrects itself very, very fast. Yeah, it, I, I agree with you, Mike. That, um, I, I just started eating a little more fiber as far as I, I ate actually a lot of peanuts, which you can eat almost unlimited. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of fiber in peanuts. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you can find ways around it. Like everyone's fiber intake is going to be different. Like mine's pretty low like i'm typically 20 grams or less a day of fiber see i'm way high <laughs> i know if i get too much fiber i tend to get a little more sure bloated and stuff but so see, I just know and I, I could eat 50 a, a day and i mean i got i think i actually watch it how much i'm taking in because you can you can overdo fiber without a doubt yeah so. you can the other thing is i found out oh, mike right away i mean i was hungrier than usual my gosh especially after breakfast yeah, and, and I was eating a fair amount, but it's just, I, I don't know if it wasn't because it wasn't carbs or what. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these foods like, you know, breads are, you know, especially like whole wheat ones, they're pretty fibrous dense or like if yes. you have, you know, lower glycemic index carbohydrates, they take longer to break down. And for me, like that was an issue, like when I was eating carbs. So yeah, going from like brown rice to white rice, white rice was just better for me because it digests so easily and fast but it does leave you hungrier faster if you're used to that full right. feeling. Yes. So it's kind of a, that was my biggest issue is I could have no bloating and gas running off carbohydrates from my fuel source, but my energy sways were greater. And then I was just like, well, I know keto keeps my energy real consistent and I don't have the bloating and gas. So that's so basically why I just good switched you. back to go to it. Yeah. But, but I also understand this, you know, if you're thinking, well, I'm going to go on a FODMAP diet, I'm just going to stay on it, which first off, you're going to miss certain foods. But secondly, FODMAPs are really important. They're rich in vitamins, minerals, uh, fiber, antioxidants. So you really, to help keep uh, healthy bacteria in your gut, mm -hmm. you, you you need some FODMAPs. So don't, you know, you have to try to reincorporate them, but it is, <laughs> in talking to Mike, it, it sounds like you really had something from every category. Yeah. I mean, like I mean, a lactose to me, I can have lactose free milk fine. And, and that's yogurt. the oligo. Yeah. I can have yogurt fine, bread. Causes. I mean, that's not the oligo. I'm sorry, but you had nuts that were some trouble with you, weren't you? Nuts, uh, wheat. Not, wheat, yeah, uh, wheat, bread. Wheat, wheat and bread cause problems with me. Um, lactose causes lactose, some issues with me. Like I can have apples. Yep, apples. So fruits. A lot of these fruits cause issues with me. So <laughs> yeah, you, you I got the. I have something from all. Where I think uh, mine is mostly fructans, which is the oligosaccharides, mm -hmm. and uh, they're. Um, I think this is. If I read it right, Mike, that's probably the one of the most common ones is fructan. And uh, it, it's the one that... Fructans some, are in a lot of different they things. They are in a lot, of, a lot of fiber foods. So. Yeah, and it, it everyone's going to vary. I just know, yeah, just I, I'm i much happier eliminating this stuff and eating more strictly and feeling better than like trying to add some of these things in just to like not feel good later. Right, basically. right. No, I, I mean... You can get very motivated to, to you know, when you get rid of this, yeah. you feel good and you're like, gosh, I kind of forgot what it felt like to feel good anymore. So um, I would also say that it's a lot easier to prepare meals ahead of time. I mean, I don't know if you do that, Mike, at all, but I, like uh, we, we, we put together, like I'll, I'll make salmon ahead of time. It just, 
you're less likely to run into problems like what am I going to eat tonight? You know, and yeah, you just grab some food that you're not supposed to eat. I mean, I'm pretty content with having like six staple meals and just rotating. Yeah. Like I'm a pretty simple person. That's the same with me. I'm very, very personal routine. So this was easy for me to do once I got the routine. Yeah. But uh, if you like variety, you're going to have to work a little harder. And uh, yeah, you have to pay attention. I mean, the app might be more beneficial to you then. So you can constantly just look if you want to be more creative with what you eat or what you make. But I, I mean, I, even as be consistent as I am, I use that app a lot. I mean, yeah. uh, I, mean I, I, I used it this morning. I mean, it just, I'm always looking at like how much, what, what is the thing that I want to reintroduce? What, what food group is it? You know, what to cover it? Carbohydrate, yeah, I mean, like for me, I I used to like apples. <laughs> yeah. I still think they taste good, but they just yeah, they just don't agree with me. Like when I was eating carbs, I I I switched to citrus fruit. Citrus fruit didn't bother me, like pineapple, oranges, stuff like that. Now um, pineapple is low food man, fun man. Yeah. yeah, and so it's like like I and even grapes, on keto, green, green I have. Grapes. Like of some berries, um, they're pretty low FODMAP. I know, like I think blueberries. Blueberries, you have to are watch. Do, uh, blueberries, you have to watch. Blackberries can be bad. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's, they're in the uh, polyol. No, they're in one of the groups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, it just said connection loss. That right. was my mouse. Okay. All right. Well, I anything else, Mike? You want to add? I think I covered all the points that I. Did. Yeah, I think I'm all right. I really like to encourage you to give it a try. I mean, there's, you know, what's the bet? The hurt if if it doesn't work, yeah. it doesn't work. And if you need help, um, like a lot of registered dietitians know this stuff and they're taught this, and they can definitely work with you, and you can work with it with your doctor. You know, if you're unsure, or you can ask them. Um, you yeah, know. I mentioned it to my doctor, and and she said that she had a lot of patients that were helped by it. I mean, I already had been helped by it. I, I just, Mike and I were both self-taught on this. We yeah. just did our own reading on it. There's a ton of information uh, online. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, give it a, uh, give it a try, and uh, put your comments below if you're not listening to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. If you're watching the YouTube, uh, put your comments below and, and tell what has helped you. And what has not helped you? And so yeah, and down below I'll link the university's uh, website on FODMAP. I'll link some high FODMAP, low FODMAP list sites, and then uh, the other one's just kind of like the history of the FODMAPs. If you're nerdy and you want to read about that, there we go. All right, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks and listening. <laughs>